watercolor wizards, Hajra here. Today we'll be perusing through my travel easel art kit now that it's full and updated and in use and also flipping through my travel portfolio and discussing what's in there as well. Thanks for parking your brushes here and let the epic art adventures begin. Remember, $7 patrons get all my new, longer YouTube videos, free passes to my six previous Skillshare videos, along with many other info-dense deconstructed art and Q&A posts, video notes, and sketch downloads. I'll do the portfolio first because it's neater. This is actually on the cover. It popped off. I'm going to have to find some way of gluing it back on or not using it, but that was what my cover photo was. My travel portfolio. So basically, if you are an artist and you want to have an easy thing that you can sort of carry around with you, then I would suggest this postcard-sized album art prints in here that you can get uh, in postcard size off of Redbubble, whether it's a potential client or if it's just somebody interested in your art or if you're teaching someplace, you can pass it around in the audience. It's very useful for lots of different things. So this is what I have this here for. I try to update it every few years. This was a request from one of the viewers on YouTube for me to flip through this. So if you find it boring, you just skip to the travel easel part. I think Mark Campbell was flipping through his portfolio and then other people were, and then now somebody asked me. So this is Mark's fault, basically. I have a card here and I try to put it on both sides because that way you can have my name and my website and my my email and my occupation there. I also have it in the back. So there's, it's gonna be the first page and the front and the back. Okay, so now let's flip through this and talk about these pieces. So I've got different sections for watercolors, gouache, and ink, and also for master studies and originals. It makes it easier for people to sort of flip through and see what you're actually sharing with them if it's thematically divided. So I'm gonna start with watercolors and I've got my botanical peacock. It does shrink down, so you don't see like all the huge amounts of detail, but they do get an idea of that it's an intricate watercolor piece. Because if you do have a compact travel portfolio, then you're gonna have to pay that price of it's at a smaller size. So if you want it to be much larger and they can see the pieces better, then you have to pay a different price, which is that you're gonna have to carry around something bulkier and it takes up more space. I prefer the smaller one because it takes less space and it doesn't weigh as much. There's also my Carolina Parakeet from the Animal Artist Collective print your art out at postcard size as you can sort of confirm whether or not it shrinks down well. And if it shrinks down well, then it's a good work of art. Also, if it blows up well, it's a good work of art. If you have a good artwork, a good painting, it'll look good at various sizes. I really like the color scheme for this piece and it would be nice to do another parrot in the future sometime, maybe in gouache, cause this was watercolor. And I like the spectral color scheme here. There's a wild carrot and there's my pika and there's a shoe in watercolor. This demonstration in part one and two is also on, on YouTube and for all of these pieces, unless I specifically say, it's probably gonna be on YouTube as a demo, but this one has not, but it does have a deconstructed post on Patreon for that one. This is another AAC piece. It's the caribou and the moon, and it's a circular piece. And this is also a great idea for if you want to upload a piece onto Redbubble that'll look good on a clock, is if you do something that's automatically round, I've noticed all the round pieces that I did make like instantly great clocks. What I still like about this piece is that I tried to have a repetitive theme of circle. So the whole piece is a circle and you have the crescent moon in this little sliver here that's also circular. And then also the caribou's antlers here are also giving us a little bit of a circular rep repetition. And so I like that kind of shape repetition in my pieces. And here's the goat. This is the one I did on Skillshare that made me leave Skillshare because they were so crappy. But this is that goat piece that I did in watercolor pencil. And he's originally on a circle and that disappears because it's a white thing. Here's another AC piece. This is a peacock that I did in watercolor. It was an ink and wash actually because it has some ink. And also it's got these lovely wet and wet effects. And I think these are some of my favorite types of backgrounds when I do choose to do a background. Yeah, I like the sort of pop effect uh, in a sort of JC Line Decker or old magazine type style where there's just a white background to give you maximum contrast or I like a stylish background like this or like this where it's either abstract or doing something a little bit more whimsical. Here's my befriend piece. It looks really good at stickers too. I have these on stickers on Redbubble as well. Still enjoy this piece and in fact I'm going to be doing a series of these, um, another eight at least that are on these little circular illustration board pieces as part of a solo spotlight exhibition. I'm hoping that'll happen in Santa Cruz. Here's a flamingo and I did this as a collab with Denise last year. So this is also in a video. This is in watercolor and I really love how beautifully rich these colors turned out. I still really like these mixes. So there's that secretary bird that was in the other part of the video. But I think the flamingo is better rendered because I think adding the clothes to him made him just a bit more awkward just around the vest area. So I think if I did this bird again, that's something that I would change because I don't really like how that vest ended up. Another really old piece that I did, um, I think at this point several years ago with the crow smoking a hookah and 
having his little red scarf and all his pillows around him. And it's it's a really pretty piece in the original size too. This is quite large. I think it's like 12 by 18. And it was one of my first pieces in watercolor actually. So this is the full watercolor version that I did for Skillshare. And this one has a, a purple grisaille under it. And you may not be able to tell because when you do the layers over the top and glazes, that purple has turned to brownish shadows for the yellow part and it's turned into even darker shadows where you have the green. But the reason there's a lot of really good value punch here is because I had a grisaille value underpainting here in purple. This is a Statue of Liberty piece that I did. This is just granulating color. This is not filmed. I don't think I did this as a video. A quick piece I did on the side. Can't even remember which colors I used. I think these are Daniel Smith colors off of the dot card. What I really enjoyed was this granulation that happened everywhere up here, down here, and on the face. It just makes the whole thing look a bit more oxidized. And so these last pieces are together because they're really not that realistic. They're much more fun. So this is actually much more cartoony in comparison, but I did have a lot of fun with the backgrounds here. Again, these are the type of backgrounds that I like. So I like the autumn colors here, and I really like the runaway bunny with the wings and this spray of fruit and leaves back here. So here's these two bunnies I did a few years back for Easter. I really like that there's one egg sitting in the center here and they have like, they're like little bunny sentries guarding the Easter eggs. But this is one of my favorite pieces. I really, really love Christmas candy and I love Christmas decoration. It brings a lot of fond nostalgic memories back from my childhood. It's what inspired me to do the parakeet in the same way because the parakeet also has these, this hanging, candy and ornaments element to it, except for here it looks more like it's a bird toys, but it's the same concept and I couldn't help throwing that tassel in there because I love doing the tassels too. There's a little one right there too. From an old picture book that I did um, some years ago off of a Kickstarter and it's based off of a real wolf named Journey. And he was the first wolf back in California in over a century. So I did a picture book on him some years ago. And the grass here and how a very limited palette of just purple and yellow, that's all I used for the whole book still gives you a lot of atmosphere and having that really faded line back there, it just gives you such a misty effect of you don't know what's going on back there. And I really like the grass here and the active pose of him rolling and scratching. And this one, he's howling at the moon. More abstract background that's further away. Very simple, I had to leave space for the picture book text and all of these pages. So, you, you know, you have to gauge balance and and lay out differently if you're doing a picture book. If you're doing a picture book, then you actually have to leave some space where once you put the text in, then it's fully balanced. So there's the moon, and I actually did that by just putting a coin there when the page was wet and lifting that paint out, and that's a great way to get yourself a moon or a planet, is just to use a coin lift several years old at this point, one of the first watercolor pieces that I was attempting in full. And I like still how I did the vignette here. I think that's really well done. But I think the nose here, I could have done a better job along this side now. The eyebrows and everything, they're doing the right kind of taper and fade and everything. And got the darker corners of the mouth here. We've got the zones of the face with that being yellow, that being more reddish, that being more bluish and greenish. And so there's a lot of concepts here that I was already applying for proper painting. But I feel like the nose could have been better. These polar bears are done actually in gouache, but one of these cases where I was using the gouache, but not like gouache, I used it transparent like watercolor. And you can see that it has more of a granulating sort of texturized feel here. It looks more like crayon or pastel. It's because the paper that I painted on had more texture in it. So the paint caught in the texture because it wasn't as finely ground as a watercolor paint, which wouldn't give you such a texturized effect on the, on this paper. These two are more of a focal point, so you can't, you know, I didn't want them to all be focal points. This one is looking that way. Backgrounds with the saran wrap, and I show that in the video. So don't be surprised when you get to my older videos that you'll see lower quality video because, well, I didn't always have an expensive camera. I got that once I got onto Patreon. The saran wrap on the top and the bottom was a great job of showing all that icy stuff. It was really fast and easy, and it just looks so stylish. It doesn't have to look realistic. The stylish part of it is oftentimes more important to me, because I feel like I've done these guys a little bit more realistically, and then I can do the actual background in a little bit more of a stylish way, and that sort of scratches my itch not to make it fully boring. I feel like if something is realistic from front to back everywhere, and it can get a bit boring, at least for me. I've seen other people do it marvelously, but it's just not my cup of tea. See more of a candy theme going on here because I love the whole striped candies especially. I love candy canes and striped peppermint candies. And so I like doing this ombre effect where it went from the green to the blue green the whole way down and ended with a little bell there. And this is based off of a pet goat that I had named Lucky Button who passed away. And he didn't have these markor horns, so these kind of horns show up in 
a goat that's found in Afghanistan and Pakistan. He's actually the national animal of Pakistan, and he's uh, got these amazing horns. It's called a mark whore. But I gave Lucky Button in this painting these horns because I want to imagine that he's in heaven and gotten so old and happy there that he's got a super long beard and he's got horns that are curling and he's all happy. This is my Russian castle and flying ship painting. Well, this is just St. Bas Basil's or Basil's Cathedral in Russia, but I really think it looks like a perfect fairy tale castle and it was one of my first uses of this round paper again. Down here was supposed to be something different. It was supposed to be in a snow globe and I mentioned this in the original video that it was my way of improvising to save it because I didn't actually like how it looked in the snow globe. So I went and used white paint to turn this into a cloud wall a, a moving in or a fog or something. If you have opaque paint to maybe change something around a bit. I really love the castle with that white ship coming there and the galaxy. To me it just looks like, feels like childhood fantasy storybook. Lots of fun. This is the gouache section. So you saw it started with watercolor. I used to have tabs that stuck out, but they sort of fell out. So now I just wrote it on the pages. So I had a watercolor section. I have a gouache section. Now I'm going to have an ink and wash section. So this is the last of the gouache pieces on this side. And that would be this cardinal. And this cardinal had a Grisaille value underpainting in gray underneath it. You can still see it in some parts around here. And I showed it in the video for this where I then came back over and did the red part of it. So I really enjoy this cardinal. An ink and wash piece. This is a Halloween collaboration that I did with Sade. And this was in ink tense, I think. So this was like, I did the waterproof marker and then I did the ink tense and really like the galaxy in the background. And I'm still really happy with how this translucent veil or dubatta is sort of dragging all this, you know, weight and movement through this part of the painting. And I like how it shows up translucently her arm through it. So here's more ink and wash and this is getting simpler now with this uh, scarecrow. This was done in Viviva color sheets and the actual line work of course was done with waterproof Sig Rider. But I did all these cool wet and wet effects with the Viviva color sheets and that's also in a video. Ink and wash again using gouache and it's funny you can tell the difference because even when you're using it more transparently the gouache shows up thicker where you get it even a little bit darker. So it has a little bit of a difference to it. So you can use it as watercolor. They'll have a little bit more texture that shows up because it's not as finely ground on certain papers, especially with the aqua sticks, which are, you know, in crayon shape anyway. And here's more ink and wash. These are my silly Easter chicks and they've become my little, a few of them have ended up as icons on my um, Patreon for my different tiers. And now I only have two tiers. So there's only two of them there now. And then these are my Halloween owls that I also did in ink and wash and it's just a lot of fun to do something this simple every now and again Which is almost like no work at all, but is very fulfilling Those are all the originals and now the rest of this portfolio in the back because you want to have your originals in the front Is going to be master studies And so I have some master studies back here because I do teach classes on master studies And so it is important to have that now if you're showing a portfolio at a illustration or art conference Probably not a good idea to have more than just one or two master studies don't have a whole section on them because they want to see your original art. So unless you're teaching master studies like I am for like actual classes and stuff, then don't have um, a big section on, on master studies. A Henry Clive master study that I did in watercolor. Still really happy with it. This is still one of the, the watercolor pieces that I like. I think the only thing that I would have changed a bit looking back on it is this finger right here. There's something creepy about it. <laughs> I think I would have probably made it so this knuckle line over here wasn't as deep and it came out a bit. It would make it so that this wasn't as sort of um, creepy Skeletor looking, that one finger. So I think that's the one problem I have with this piece right now. I think I could have done a more complicated butterfly. This is an easy butterfly, but there's nothing really wrong with this butterfly. It's just not as complicated. I do really like the background. Again, I, I just have so much fun with those wet and wet backgrounds. I know they're like super simple, but when I do do a, a background, if it's like this, then I'm always happy with it versus when it's more sort of like has actually has objects and stuff in it. Afterward, usually I'm not happy with it. So I think I really just like abstract stylized backgrounds. You can see this little gossamer threads weaving through it maybe. And that's actually a wax pencil that I put down before I put the wet and wet wash in. And it gave all these cool strands in the background. So you can always have like a little bit of a wax pencil there as a resist. And again, this is on YouTube as part of a watercolor versus gouache video demo. Then I've got this one. And this was a Walter Crane study I did. And this is part of a Skillshare video, which you can still watch 
uh, for free. If you're a $7 patron, you will get all six of my Skillshare videos for free, and this is one of them. And I really like, again, the background here. I like the tiles because it's very decorative, then I'm perfectly happy to paint it. If it's like a mosaic or a tile or something more decorative. And there's a little bit of a cool quirky element here with these weird things that she had hanging off the sides of her sleeves, like little leaves, and you know, just a lot of fun to do this study. Oh, and I liked a little cap too. And I also like the dress, because even though it's medieval, it looks very Pakistani as well. Zorn Widow Study, and it was basically a gris eye because it was done in one color. I think this is sodalite. Genuine, given some really cool granulating effects here, which makes the bustle of her dress here more interesting, also the sleeve here just from the granulation. So if you're doing a, a piece where you're gonna rely on some of the texture for visual interest, a granulating color is a good idea. Here's another Grisai study I did of a Alphonse Muha painting. And this was the Evening Star, I believe. And I did a recent master class at the Santa Cruz Art League where I did Muha's Moon Personified. At this stage and stopping here, it felt so satisfying that I did not go and finish it with colors. It just was so pretty like this, I just left it alone. And Edmund Duloc, or Edmol Duloc, was another amazing Golden Age illustrator, and he didn't have pieces that were as realistic as Muha's, or more realistic than Muha, like a Lion Decker. He was more in the realm of a Rackham, or a Kai Nielsen, or an Aubrey Beardsley, stylized and a little bit more cartoony, and less realistic, so you can see that here. 2009, so that's like 10 years old now, but this was one of the first watercolor pieces I ever did, and it was also the first piece I ever painted in Schmincke. <laughs> so that's kind of weird. Um, when I was younger, I didn't study art or watercolor. I just did a lot of drawing, so I had a lot of ink drawings and pencil drawings, and this was a Mary Blair study where I took one of the doll sketches that I saw at the Walt Disney Family Museum that wasn't even in color, and I used all of her labels that she'd labeled for the colors to draw this again, and then to do the, the colors as she was labeling them. So I had a lot of fun doing that, because it was almost like she I just had like a crib sheet for this character, and then I just had a lot of fun having a color version even though there was no original color version. It's a small world ride, it had dolls from everywhere. So this is from South Asia. And since my family is uh, Pakistani Persian, I really liked the idea of doing that uh, as a piece. The most viewed master study I have, even though it's not explaining anything about Henry Clive who did this original, it's because it was part of my watercolor versus gouache video series. And this one got the most views. It's got like over, I don't know, it's around 450,000 at this point. Once one video takes off, it doesn't matter if it's your best video or not, everybody will keep watching it because the algorithm will, will throw it out at you. More recent videos that are better at explaining watercolor versus gouache, but because this video has been popular for a while, people will still watch that. In real life, it's actually this size or smaller. So that's how small I painted it. This is one of my first gouache pieces that I ever did. And it had a gris eye underneath it and then the gouache over the top. I think I did a Batman piece before this and this is literally the second piece I ever did in gouache. Here's another uh, master's study. And this is again, Andrew Zorn. This one is on Skillshare, I believe. So, and again, you'd get it for free if you're on my Patreon. You'll notice that everything in this background is beautiful. The wallpaper, the couch, the rug, and this big dress and everything. So again, if it's decorative, I like decorative elements. One of my favorite master studies I actually have it as the banner of my Patreon header because I really enjoyed this gouache piece and it, I love the impressionistic effects that I got here with the gouache. And this is the Blue Veil by Henry Tarbell. You can go and look at it, original, if you live in or around San Francisco. It's hanging up at the, the De Young Museum, I believe, in San Francisco. That's in Golden Gate Park. And oh my god, every time I see this painting now, I feel like you know, it's like a friend because I painted it. And I think if I made this any different now, I think I tried to be even more fluid with the uh, veil strokes here. So I think they're pretty good. Like if I cut off this part right here, just this last bit right here, not even this part, it's this fold right here. And I could probably go back and remedy that in the original if I could be bothered. <laughs> but that part needs to be a bit more, I think, flowing and soft and just the angles. I don't think it's as graceful. So that's Joseph Christian Lion Decker, and he was probably one of my most favorite illustrators from the Golden Age, along with Alphonse Muha, because you can't beat these two guys for their layout skills and also their rendering skills. It's just both of them together. It's meant to look like they're oil painting, because that's what the originals were in. I mean, except for Henry Clive, who paints in pastels and also makes them look like oil. So all of these other people were painting in oil, but I wanted to paint it in gouache because I am allergic to the kind of fumes that would come out of oil paint. And then I did it in gouache, but try to make it look like oil. And the, the most effective way to do that is to make sure it looks opaque and very well blended. And then it'll look like oil, you know, because that's what oil looks like. It's got soft edges and it's opaque. 
after you build up layers. He was a watercolor wizard, which is why I loved, you know, doing a study of this because my channel, I always address everybody as watercolor wizards. Putting the pencil in here, it was still a really good idea. I really liked that uh, instead of he was holding like a telescope or something like that. And because we're artists, so I wanted to change it to a pencil. I was considering a paintbrush, but I said this in the video too, which was I didn't like how the paintbrush looked under his arm. It just wasn't as appealing. So I re-sketched it to be a pencil. And the rendering here on the face, I'm really happy with that. Really happy with the hands and everything. Still really happy with this piece in general. I think this knee line here that I came back and added in, even though he has it in his original, I just don't like that little bulge there. So I think if I wanted to ever touch that up, I'd get rid of that little line there. This is George Seurat's uh, impressionist Eiffel Tower that I think he did in 1895. And the tower wasn't actually finished when he was painting this, and so the top of it isn't fading away. It's just actually not finished um, at the time. He was painting it when it was being built. And I really, really enjoyed the pointillism and the look of it, the sort of vibrating quality of chromoluminarism that happens with these, you know, putting in stippling in these different colored dots. But I, it's very labor intensive and it's not really, you know, it's not my style for a lot of other things, city lights feeling. So now these are my ink and wash master studies because again, I went from watercolor to gouache and these are, this is the last section. And this one is uh, Kate Greenaway. It's a little tea party piece I did. And I really enjoyed doing these little wrinkles the same way that Edmond Duloc has stylized fabric wrinkles. Kate Greenaway does the same thing. And I liked making one of these girls, uh, a minority, a, a bit more of a diverse selection of people here. And Cecily Mary Barker's Flower Fairy. This is a fuchsia fairy, and that's what I really enjoyed doing the ink and wash piece for this as a master study. I think I used Daniel Smith colors for this, and I didn't. I used some Schmincke iridescent medium to make the wings a bit more sparkly. Again, I showed that in two videos, one for the wings and one for the rest of the fairy. And I think the only thing that I was unhappy with when I was doing this was I had messed up on the eyes, and I had to sort of smear up and lift out the eyes and do them again a few times and I felt like I was getting irritated <laughs> by the time I was done and it turned out okay but a part of it was uh, you know when you paint this small and you mess something up it's a big mess up. Ink and wash peacock after a stained glass window that was created by Tiffany. This was also fun and I always tell people all the time I did another recent stained glass study of a hundred year old window that I saw in San Francisco you get these ink lines in there and then you do the wet and wet washes for all the stained glass. It's so much fun. It's very easy and you want to have a, a satisfying day with your watercolors, you can always do that. John Bauer study that I did earlier this year and John Bauer is also a super talented artist. He died very young, unfortunately, in a shipwreck. And I really like the browns and the trolls and all the forest creatures and gnarly wood bark, you know, trolls and goblins that he did. Again, highly inspirational to people like Brian Froud and Tony Dieterlitzi and stuff, so a troll, but that's the troll mama, and then that's the captive princess, and the actual original had three big troll sons, which I didn't do. But it was a lot of fun rendering these rocks. And this is a combination ink tense with a little bit of uh, white gouache. And this is Dory the Witch from a picture book by Patricia Coombs that uh, was a pile of old picture books that we found at the library when we were growing up, and still one of my favorite characters, her in her black cat gink, and she's a little kid witch that gets in trouble doing all sorts of little things and it's just a great spooky Halloween book. And I did this in Viviva color sheets too with these lovely bleeds and everything. The original was black and white and so the colors are something that I chose and made up and it's fun to do that too if you find a black and white illustration to do a study of to just add your own colors. Sinbad being carried off by the rock. But anyway I had a lot of fun doing the ink on here because you can see that the rock and his talons have a different texture, feathers have a different texture, the sky has a different texture, clouds, mountains, everything. There's a lot of different ink, ink techniques that you can learn by doing just this one study. You've got every kind of ink stroke in here, from contouring to hatching, cross-hatching, stippling, everything. This is a, a Muha study that I did. I actually also have a color version of this now. I did another version with color that I guess I have to scan and upload at some point. And that would be the end of the portfolio. All right, so if you want to check out a video on my entire travel easel that shows like how it tilts up and you know what it looks like when it's zoomed out then check out a separate video for that okay so in this video i'm just showing the inner contents of this now in use as i'm teaching and traveling so i've got watercolor gouache and ink in here because those are the mediums i teach and i paint in and i want to go through all these drawers real quick just so i can show you what i've got here my collapsible silicone water cup is not here and also my empty ice cream container that i use as a travel water 
cup with lid is also not in here, but I'll show pop-ups for those. So this easel is only 25 or $30 on Amazon. So it was a really good value and it has a tiltable top like I showed in the other video. And the only thing I added to the outside is a silicone strap. This minor clip doesn't open up far enough to be hooking over the top of the actual easel when it's tilted open. And also my hands aren't strong enough to get bigger binder clips that open far enough. So my solution to that was just to have the silicone band that's like a big giant rubber band over the top here and then put my binder clips there and then attach my paper like that. So that's what that's in here for. So what's the rest of the junk in this drawer? I've got that tape, I've got a pencil sharpener, I've got an eraser, got those binder clips that I said I used. I've got some wax pencils in here for wax resist and highlight savings because I don't um, like to use masking fluid. So this is dry and easy. It's not removable, but it is very simple and feel safe to have a clear wax resist as a highlight. So I've got my watercolor paint and my gouache paint. So this is my uh, Sennelier Aqua Mini that I just pulled out of its tin and it's just got the plastic part of it and it fits in there better. I've got a ruler of straight lines or if gridded or if I want a proportional divider I can use the side of this to make, um, you know, measurements. I've got the bottom of a tin that I took off of a color pencil tin because it fits into this drawer here and this is my extra mixing palette space whether it's watercolor or gouache I can use that right here and it doesn't take up any extra space because it's fitting right into that drawer and it's very flat and open. So you know, a good way to try to have multi-use things in your drawer that are also not taking up that much space. And these are my post-its in case I have a few notes I need to make about teaching or something and they go right under here. I've got another tin here and it's got a teeny tiny palette in it if I'm painting jewelry. Um, I'm sad to say that even though this is the most expensive palette I ever bought and it's very pretty, it is really too tiny for me to use for anything, including paint storage. When people say just use it for paint storage, it doesn't really store that much paint. And also on top of that, it gets the adjacent colors muddy very fast if you try to get colors out of here if they're filled up to the top. So I actually just think this is a very useless palette. I know that some people like it, but it was totally not something that's been working for me. I just have it here if I do jewelry painting or just to show people a pretty little palette. And I've got this portable painter palette which has far more useful space and this is for my gouache stuff. So if I wanna do a gouache demo or travel gouache painting, plenty of mixing space just in here so I don't have to use this but I do have that extra space if I need it. I've got extra mixing space in this tin in the top and the bottom if I really wanted to use it. And these are my Creta colors that are in here all of these colors will last forever. So I probably won't need to refill these colors for travel painting or teaching for a long time. Got two water brushes with water in it in case I wanna just do some ink and wash and maybe wet the ink marker and make it run a bit. So it's just hanging out right there. I've got a few small angle brushes and filberts, another chop down angle right there. I've got a sketching pencil. I don't really do much sketching when I'm painting. I just do most of the drawing with the paint itself. So I just need like any kind of basic sketching pencil in here. I've also got a sharpener. I've got a clear marker by Tombow and, and you can wet your ink line or your watercolor paint and it'll spread just a little bit. It's not really that wet. It doesn't spread that much, but it is nice to have a clear marker here. And I've got a tiny spotter brush because I like having really teeny eyes and details and highlights and stuff. So if I need that, that's right there. Here's a size two silver brush black velvet in case I wanna have any detailed areas and I need a little round for that. A larger round brush in case I'm doing a larger demo and need to have a larger brush there. I got these brush covers off of Amazon years and years ago. It was just one pack that had assorted sizes and they're made out of this plastic mesh and they're pretty stiff and they stay on this so that if I knock this drawer around, these are all protected. I put it over the top of, you know, any brush I want like this one. And see, now it'll protect it. And because it's mesh, it'll also keep it dry if I put it in there damp and also it molds the shape back together so that the hairs don't split and it doesn't tend to move that much so again it protects it while it's traveling and this is just a bigger size filbert that I have in like half an inch or larger. Here's my white jelly pen for white highlights although I also have my white gouache in here for that and here's my black zig writer and I really love this marker because not only is it light fast and archival and pigment based and waterproof but it's got the two ends so it's two markers and one where I can do a thicker line and fills with that and I can do a thinner 0.5 millimeter line with that side. I mean, this is already a lot for me. This is the most I've ever traveled with, but that's because again, I'm teaching now too, but I think it has everything I need to do a sketch, to do ink work, to do watercolor work, gouache work, 
even jewelry painting if it's miniatures. And I've got all the stuff that I need to erase and mount my stuff and tape it down and sharpen my pencil. And I even got a little ruler and a mixing palette here and all of this will fit into this drawer and pop back into that easel. So it's very compact. Now apart from that easel, all I'm gonna have is a water cup. And if I take the collapsible one, it can fit right here. Otherwise I can carry a water bottle. Apart from this easel that I can now just carry, I've just got one folder that has my sketches for different things and some extra paper, watercolor and cardstock and also some teaching tools. My different watercolor effects that I'm gonna show. So if I have to show them for a class, I can pop these up on the easel and go through these. I've shown these in a video already, real time. So if you wanna look at that, you can do that. Also, I've got my ink effects sheet and my watercolor pencil sheet, and they're all here to teach color theory. So this first one is to teach grisaille variations. And then the rest of these are the achromatic, monochromatic. And if you're on Patreon, then you have seen these in a post on Patreon and also the uh, sketch downloads that you can do if you want to make your own. And so it goes through everything analogous complements and it has these various color wheels as well that are showing various uh, types of color schemes that you can get from just a limited set of colors. And in this case, it's useful because I am actually traveling with the Aqua Mini and I think this is the Aqua Mini Sennelier that I'm showing here. This folder is one of those folders that I said I'm no longer gonna use for a portfolio for to store my pieces, but it's nice to travel with until it breaks apart. And once this zipper fails, I'm just gonna use the little binder clips on the top because I think the plastic will probably stay intact longer. And these are the sketches that I have that I'm taking with me that you know I, I give to people if they wanna transfer their own drawing or if I need to redo my drawing if I mess up or something. The last little thing I have is a little washcloth. And this is actually something I got from one of my patrons and the full size didn't fit in the drawer. So I actually cut it off, but um, I did hem and keep the other side. So the other side's all neat and clean and pretty and beautiful to be used at home. And this smaller piece can fit into this drawer. The full size of this just wouldn't fit in this drawer, but I can fit this in here just very easily. Yeah, so that's my, that's all my entire travel kit. Very compact, just this box. Well, wizards, I hope you enjoyed seeing my updated travel easel painting kit and my compact travel portfolio. Please like, comment, and check out my website dashboard for easy access to all of my online platform links on a single page to support my art creation and instruction. Thanks for parking your brushes here and wishing you all epic art adventures.